If you're going to stare down a dragon, you better do it with confidence. House of the Dragon, episode six? I'm losing count. <laughs> Pretty sure I've said that before in the intros to these things. But this is the latest episode. I'm a little bit late getting my review out uh, versus when I like to try and do that. I've got a lot on my plate. I'm working on a very substantial video for the main channel to be out hopefully this Saturday. So yeah, uh, <laughs> dealing with a lot right now. But regardless, this is good. But like the second episode, which I have admitted I might have been harsher on than I intended to be because I was just not in a great mood of that, that day when I both watched and shot it. But like that episode, I, can't, I came away from this feeling like what's in here is pretty good, but I'm not sure why it's stretched over as long a runtime as it is. I feel like the major points and takeaways that I took, at least that were new, that weren't strictly reiterative, which a lot of the stuff with, like, say, Damon felt. Like, his his story arc has felt like it has been just spinning wheels for a bit now. Like, they, they got to they gotta freaking move that forward. Hopefully, now that the Elder Tully is dead, he'll act, Damon will actually freaking do something. But storylines like that aside, which is just, like, why... Um, the, the major points that are like, okay, cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's important to know. That's a good moment. I feel like could have been done in less time. Uh, again, it's, it's tricky because it's, it's hard to talk about these things because you can come across as an unpleasable critic because I'll talk about other shows, um, stuff like The Acolyte saying, boy, Either they need more episodes or the episodes need to be longer because scenes need room to breathe. And then I watch something like this and I'm like, these scenes are dragging. You need to tighten this stuff up. And I know it can seem like, well, there's just no pleasing you, is there? Like, no, it just means that there's a middle ground. There's a sweet spot that can be tricky to hit. You can overshoot it. You can undershoot it. So that's it's just kind of where I get left. I would love to tighten this episode up. A fair bit, if I'm being honest. That having been said, moving that issue aside, just understand it kind of hung over most of the episode. I, I was checking the time repeatedly throughout the second half of this thing. Ah, um, But there were definitely some key moments. Um, Allison being asked by Eamon to leave, well, not asked, told, being relieved of her duties on the small council was a really good moment, especially because uh, what was sold through Allison as a character, at least what I got, was that she she didn't really want to be there. She didn't really have a desire to do this. But she is deeply afraid of what's going to happen if she is not a voice of reason in the room. And so she's been fighting to stay there. And it's... It, it's really interesting to watch somebody in a position that they don't want to be in, but they still feel it's important for them to be in and then have to struggle with losing that or fight to keep it when on a pure, like, what would you like to do with your life level? She probably would not be there. She doesn't want to, but she kind of needs to be. This is uh, also continuing on in a, I would say better than token, but only by so much acknowledgement of the common people um, I've mentioned before that a big thing that this whole series is missing is a sense of just the people of Westeros. Like, we have all this stuff about the the royals, the movers, the shakers, and we get very flinting, uh, flinting? Fleeting glimpses of quote-unquote normal people. And we, we've gotten a little bit over the last couple of episodes, although this kind of tips its hand that, like, we're only getting that insofar as they are being used as pawns by the royals between each other. Now, that's still an interesting tactic. The whole, like, send food, get these people to really resent the the people ruling the land where they are and start to think maybe the people that we have been told to hate aren't so bad. Like, that tactically, that's all really interesting. But it did kind of um, give the game away that the only reason we're getting any glimpse of what's happening at the ground level in places like King's Landing is only in so far as um, how it is impacting the royals and the movers and the shakers. And like, again, I understand that's who the show is about, 
But one, I, I've said it before. One of the things I really appreciated about early Game of Thrones, it fell off as the thing went on and also went downhill. Um, but one of the things I really liked about early Game of Thrones is it felt like a very complete world. It didn't feel like, here's the royals and the rest of it, yeah, it's out there somewhere. You had a real tangible sense of place, of people, and you don't with this show. Now, like... One could argue that it's okay for it to largely bank on the foundation that Game of Thrones laid for stuff like that. I would say that there's actually a tangible benefit to having stuff like that, that this is currently lacking. Um, but, it, but it is still, like, an interesting plot point, and it is still interesting to see things get used in that way and to move forward in that fashion. So we have the whole idea of... Uh, of people uh, descended from the Targaryen bloodline, but a bit diluted, um, possibly being dragon riders. And I was pretty positive that first guy was, it was not going to go well for him. Um, that said, I'd like the, that actor uh, for who, Sir, whoever it was, Sir Crispy Dragon Meat, um, he brought a lot of uh, personality, a lot of characterization to a very short, amount of screen time like good on him he t he did a lot with very little he put a lot of personality in the time that he had and like i would just highlight that as just being really spot on acting because sometimes like we tend to think of acting as like you get to deliver this masterful speech sometimes you don't get that sometimes you get a scant few lines and you know a handful of minutes and maybe two days to shoot all this stuff you don't get much, but you can still bring a real sense of a complete person and of a full character with the way you deliver those lines and the way that the character carries themselves. And he did that. He did that with so little time on screen. Honestly, VIP of the episode. We'll never see him again. He's burnt to a crisp, but and I kind of wish I could remember the character's name, but good on you. Like, legitimately. Um... But I, I figured that wasn't going to work, that especially for how early in the episode it was happening. But I also figured, like, okay, well, where's it going to go from there? Because if it failed this badly, they're not going to just try again. Um, not this group, at least. I could see, say, the Greens or, um, or you know, some of the folks from Game of Thrones being like, well, that didn't work. Bring in the next one. But, like... Rhaenyra, that's that's not like that's not her approach. It's not really the approach of a lot of her uh, people uh, around her. Although, like, she's getting, I, I like I like that moment where she smacks her advisor. And is like, maybe it's my fault that you don't fear me. And while you know, generally, when it comes to ruling, I would say it's better to be respected than feared. She's clearly not being respected, so maybe feared is the uh, way to go with right now. <laughs> so. Uh, that, that felt like a, a well-earned moment. So that, like, stuff like that was good. Oh, uh, we now have a point, it would seem, to the, uh, sailor and his brother, as the brother, uh, it is certainly set up. It's not currently confirmed, but, like, certainly seems to have been set up to be the new rider for Sea Smoke. So, um, these guys now have a purpose. Like, it's really, it can be tough to introduce characters who don't have an immediate bearing on what's going on and aren't going to do anything important until a little bit later because it, you kind of give your, your you kind of have to tip your hand that these people will matter but until we find out why it's kind of like okay why why are we spending time with these people and like there are ways to do that there are ways to make the story feel more relevant and again it would help if the show felt like it was giving us more of a full world view but it's so laser focused on the royals that when it does divert to characters like the like the sailing brothers it really sticks out and it's like okay well this is here for a reason otherwise they would not be doing this the show wouldn't just show us this stuff um th there are ways to present a story where it feels more natural to have those kind of divergences and this show hasn't really done that um, for some reason, I'm suddenly thinking about Castlevania season three, where there is a captain character in that he's in, I think two, maybe even only one episode and he just owns and it doesn't feel like a diversion, nor does it feel like a loss that we don't see him again later. It's like, there is a reason to have that guy there for, 
for what he brings to the story when he's there. But whereas with these Sailing Brothers, like, they weren't contributing anything up until this point. And now we know where this is going, but up to now, every time we've seen them, it's like, and who are you again? <laughs> Why are you here? Because you're not, you're not bringing a, a cool scene in and of itself. It feels uh, a bit, you know, very structured around what the plot needs. I mean, which is good because especially in latter day Game of Thrones, a lot of stuff just felt like they didn't bother. But it it it's it's not always elegantly strung together narratively. Um so the kiss between Renera and her spy master. I her name starts with an M. I suck with these names. I'm sorry, I just do. But I I'm not sure they earned that. And I don't think there's an issue of it being two women. Like, I would feel that if she was a guy. I'm not sure they earned that degree of connection. It's not uninteresting. Actually, I think it's potentially very interesting, depending on where it goes. It also could be incredibly trite, depending on where it goes. But I, I, I didn't really feel like they'd earned that moment. I don't know. It didn't sink the episode, and I certainly didn't groan probably the way that I would have if it was a man, because then it would have just felt like the inevitable, oh, well, they're in proximity, and it's a man, and it's a woman, so yeah, of course this is going to happen. So it, it it didn't hit that level of cynicism with me, but at the same time, I am kind of like, do we need that? I don't know, maybe we do. We'll see where the story goes with it, but it, it didn't didn't feel like we'd arrived there fully. It felt like maybe the story was on its way there, but they jumped ahead a few steps. At least that was that was the energy uh, that I got off of it. Uh, Aemon is awake and uh, should be very afraid of Aemon. Um, I'm I'm finding Laris the um, the guy with the foot thing. I'm finding him less interesting as time goes on. Um, I was finding him. Interesting the way he was like slowly kind of working his way up the the ladder internally. But now that he's hit his first major stumbling block with Aemon um, passing him over for Hand of the King, he's suddenly become much more predictable in a way that I find far less interesting. <sighs> the thing is, he's very clearly kind of, he's little finger coded. He's that kind of like, ooh, nobody should trust him. He's only out for himself. First of all, we've got a few of those people already. Cole comes to mind, although, like, if he were to drop dead, that'd be absolutely fine with me. But not only does he feel kind of redundant in terms of dynamic, but the other thing with with Laris is, especially if we're going to compare to Littlefinger, was I was given reason to be invested in Littlefinger as a character. Like, season one did a lot of work to make me invest in this guy. A lot of it investing in being like, you are the absolute worst. But he was a guy who was fun to, to think that about. Laris is just kind of around and kind of a creep and feels just like a watered-down version of something that was done better before in the previous show. Thankfully, there aren't a ton of characters who are like that, but I am getting that energy off of him, which is... A shame, because I found him to be one of the more intriguing characters up to this point. And maybe he will be again. But right now, I'm just kind of like, hey, I, I, I feel like I know where we're going with you. And I feel like I've seen this. But, oh, again, overall, this was pretty good. It did felt dragged out, though. But it's solid enough. Still waiting for Abigail Thorne to show up. She has yet to appear. And I'm like, we only got, what, four episodes left this season? Come Come on. <laughs> the Acolyte was not enough. Give me more. <laughs> I, reminder, I don't actually know Abigail. I've never met her, but I do uh, enjoy her work. And props to literally any trans actress who is able to get work on major shows. Seriously. Uh, regardless, House of the Dragon, episode six, I think. Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon pays the bills and enables me to do this as my living. Even if you can't help me out that way, like, share, subscribe. They all help me out. Don't worry too much about it, though. We take a relaxed attitude around here. So you can just come on back next time you need a break. Why'd I say it like that? 
And now to thank my highest supporting patrons, Robin Moore, Zumilla Fuller, Goddess Alida, Trista Ashley, Oliver B, Melissa Peterson, Tarak, the thing that goes going to the anime, Jean Foray, Movie Turtle, Ulrich Bogdan, Loki Eris, Linda Walters, Jen, Auntie Kate 808, Becky Sparks, Renabi Lax the Poodle, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Caspero, Dave Hall, Mike Barish, Rosalind Bennett, Pal Baraba Joggle, Lucy Wood, Dorm Mayhew, and Mira G. Thank you for your support and consider supporting me as well on Patreon.